the living the living history project one of my least favorite parts of about being a middle school history teacher is the bullshit living history assignments we give at the end of every school year kids are supposed to sit with their grandparents and videotape voice record or transcribe their oldest memories for posterity and for an easy way to bring up their GPA. I have been doing this for 17 years, and when I collected the projects this time around, I assume they would be as dull, if not duller, than usual. This, is, this had not been a particular bright class. So I went home, poured myself a glass of wine, and prepared for a long night of I only owned two pairs of pants when I was your age, and my brother got beat with a newspaper for hitting a baseball in the neighbor's yard. Of course, these projects were peppered with innocent old person comments. They're so horribly sexist and racist, you just had to laugh. Now, I had a girl in my class whom I, I will call Olivia. She was a pudgy, quiet, and proved herself consistent B student. I expected her project to be as unremarkable as her, and perhaps that's why I was so profoundly disturbed by what I what I witnessed that night. Olivia had submitted two discs for some reason, so I began with the one marked interview. My screen hiccuped twice before a grainy image of a living room came into view. The place was a hoarder's hell. Olivia was curled up in an armchair, armchair clutching a notebook and looking like a scared animal. Across from her sat a man with a somber continuance, smoking a cigarette and staring at her expectantly. Go, go ahead. A woman's voice whispered from behind the camera. Olivia's owlish eyes flashed towards the screen and then back to the man. I am here with my great uncle Stephen, she began almost inaudibly. He's going to tell us about his oldest memories from being in the army. Great uncle Stephen looked like he'd rather be in a goddamn trench at the moment, but he waited patiently for the questions to begin. Not surprisingly, Olivia read the verbatim from the suggested questions sheet I'd handed out to the students. He answered her curtly. Once or twice, I heard her mother whisper, Speak up, Olivia. From behind the camera. Typical boring shit. So I was intrigued when Olivia set down the notebook and asked, Did you like being in the army? That was totally off script. Great Uncle Stephen emitted a clean smoker's wheeze. No, no, glad to get out of town, though. Where did you go? Balkans. Uh huh, she said. She said, I doubted she knew what the Balkans were. My suspicion was confirmed when she asked, Was Bacchus very different from, from here? Yes. Mom cleared her throat and behind the camera, perhaps encouraging great Uncle Stephen to be a little more forthcoming. But Olivia s seemed generally interested. Uncle Stephen, she asked. What is your worst memory of the army? The old man crushed his cigarette in the ashtray and slowly lifted himself out of the chair. I'll be back. He mumbled, the camera cut off. When the screen flashed back, everything was, exa was the exact same except Great Uncle Stephen had several pieces of paper and plastic, plastic sleeves laid on top of all the crap sitting on his coffee table, one he held in his hand. I was a kid when I was listed.
he said, looking at Olivia. Your brother's age, he told her. Olivia nodded. I never saw combat, but with my deployments in the cities when East Europe, they had been deployed by civil wars. Everything was a mess. Felt like a janitor for fuck's sake. Him, Mom coughed. Great Uncle Stephen sighed and looked at, at his paper. My unit was assigned to a school that had been obliterated by the violence, broken windows, cave in rooms, and for some reason the part that got me most was was that the school had been like this for years. Before we even got there, no one had lifted a finger to fix it. I saw kids walking by the way, the begging for their money, for whatever shit they did. The camera dipped towards the floor as I heard Mom whisper harshly at Great Uncle Stephen. I couldn't make out what he was, she was saying, but it wasn't hard to imagine. Do you want to hear this goddamn story or not? I heard him back. I heard him bark in response. Then you better let, let me tell it how I want. Mom, Olivia chimed. Please stop interrupting. Are you presenting this to the front of the class? No, Mom, we're just handing it to the teacher. I'm sure I'm sure he said was the word shit before. Great Uncle Stephen contributed, hopefully. I wasn't a he. As a matter of fact, but other than that, the statement was accurate. The camera was lifted and after a, a couple of blurry focus adjustments, the shot was the same as before. Ah, I'm talking too much anyway. He grumbled. He lifted a piece of paper in his hand and closed his face. In the basement, I found this letter. I don't know what it said, but a buddy of mine translated it. So I'm going to read it now, and then I'll tell you what I saw in that basement. A chill ran down my spine. Mom zoomed in to Great Uncle Stephen in his letter. His pal-side hands trembled as he held up the paper. This is what he read. Dear Sir, I never loved my country, so many of these skirmishes are born from patriotism, a power struggle from Charles the Great, once Great Empire, but I don't care what the name of my home was on the map. This is fi this fine is senseless, and I, and I stay as far away from it as I can. It was not these attacks and disorganized violence that took the lives of my wife and child, it was illness. Mercifully, and it happened quickly for the baby. Now I just suffered for longer, and I watched my horrid knowing that I could do nothing for them. Only the solace is that I was there for them every step of the way. I stopped going to work every day, and, not, and no one came after me. I thought that, no, that they noticed I was gone, since the school was simply across the field visible from the window. It could have been easy for to go hours each day and come home quickly to care for them, but what was the point? All I did was clean the floors. I was used to this world as I was to my family. I tried to take Nadja to the hospital, but the journey was too long and taxing. I brought her home and she died at that, that night. After Nadja and the babe were gone, well, I don't remember much, but I left the hotel, barely ate and slept. I thought many times of taking my own life, to though as it was. I felt paralyzed by my own helplessness. The only thing that kept me sane was my radio. I never turned it off once, even though I didn't listen to the words being said. In fact, the channel I got was the clearest was in English, I think. Which I don't speak of lick of. But the voice and the music was true as not life existed beyond the fire and the city sustained me. I have no idea how much time passed before I saw the light of day again. I was dizzy from hunger, so finding food was my priority. My radio came with me, of course. Since I was holed up, it was gone everywhere with me. It takes, it talks to me as I stay in it and it has a wake. I don't know what it was saying, but I know I would die without it. Once I had some water and food, it occurred to me the only thing left to do was go back to work, so I did. The final morning, I simply returned to school where I was a janitor. And got back to work. Nobody made a big deal of it. out of it. Like I said, Nacho had been sick for a long time. And those who worked at the school knew it. I appreciate no one had pestered me to come back to work during the hottest days of my life. She just never said much to me, but we smiled at each other in the house. 
and that mutual respect was perhaps the reason I decided to come back after all. The place had gone into the docks without me, so I simply grabbed my broom and rags from my closet and set to cleaning. Everyone's grateful to have me back, I know. The best part is that nobody minds my radio. I bring it with, with me everywhere and keep the volume low enough that the stairs suits. No one has ever complained. In fact, I suspect they like it. The schoolhouse is not very big, but it does require a lot of maintenance. The floors are always sticky and stained, so I spend most of my time mopping. Kids make messes, and I guess that's why I'm still in business. Sometimes I have to move things around to make sure I get every spot in the floor beautiful clean, but I can take pride in that. And the repairs, the schools always need to tune us here and there, and I happen to heal. Some days I'm constructing a desk that broke it as I whistle along with the radio. Other times I handle more serious structural issues. Things when I have to work like this, I truly, I feel truly instrumental. Like a cog in a larger machine. How could a school survive without me? It took me a long time but I once again feel that I have purpose. There's a large, there's a larder behind the school that is full of preserved food and allow of payment. I'm allowed to take as much food as I need. The arrangement is fine. What well, I do with mine anyways? I used to bring food back to my house just one field away from the school. But when I started sleeping in the basement, no one seemed to notice. The school is special to me and I cannot leave it unguarded. When I am besieged with memories of my wife and baby, I turn up the volume on the radio to drown out such thoughts. It's for me every time, except this morning, because this morning, I woke up to dead silence. Frankly, explaining the radio, I had to see what had happened. Honestly, I cannot tell you how many days in a row I had been using it. They would simply live out as life and die naturally. I had spent the entire day trying to fix it. Most of the time I have been crying, I am almost losing my mind without it. I am getting myself until sundown. If I cannot fix it by then, then I'm going to take my life. I am riding this because the sunlight is starting to die, and I know what my fate shall be. I have thought about the long last night walk through the halls of my school, saying goodbye to students and teachers. I know I'll be missed, but I cannot bring myself to leave this room. I cannot go anywhere knowing that my radio is dead in here. There are no more tears in me. It feels now like I can catch my breath. I found what little food I had in my stomach, and I'm growing dizzy again. Like I did after Nacha died. I am not long for this world. Before I take my life, I closed the door to the room and struck a chair between the handle. It's the only room in the basement that has a small casement that lets in just enough light for me to see what I'm doing. Anyone is kind enough to come looking for me, they should not be met with this gruesome sight. Press to see the door is blocked. Smell my rotten body and simply forget I ever existed. But I have placed both my radio and the stone outside the door. Kind sir, if you're reading this, I have one humble request. Please fix it. Save my radio. It did not deserve to die in a sleep, and I am ashamed that I cannot revive it. Now I'm ready to join Nacha and, and little Lumia. In heaven, hope this, hope this school can find another janitor who loves cares for the way I do. The hour is now. Do not forget my radio. Stanislav. When Mom zoomed back out, Olivia had tears in her eyes. Thank you for sharing, Uncle Stephen. Mom said with her voice choked. I think we had enough. Wait! Olivia chirped. He said there's more. What did you find? Before great uncle Stephen could f open his mouth, the image disappeared. My jaw dropped. What was it? What did great uncle Stephen see? I probably remembered that there was a second disc. The one was unmarked, but I hoped to contain the rest of the interview. There was no video, only audio. The voice that started up was Olivia's. Hi, Miss Gertie. I'm sorry about my mom, but she refused to record the rest of what my uncle was saying, but I actually continued and secretly recorded the story as a voice memo on my phone. I remember what you said earlier this year, that history is written by people who win wars. 
She sucked in a breath and commenced crying. But everyone's history is important, even if they are sad, pathetic people, and even if they never want a single thing in their life. I haven't slept through the night since I finished this project. But you have to hear what my uncle has to say. There were tears in my eyes, too, and the sincerity of her words was beautiful. I was also flattered that she had remembered some of trite phrase I threw around because it was what my history teacher said to me. Before I got too sappy over it, the audio began again. Fine, came on's frustrated voice. If you want to hear the rest of the story, fine. But this is not appropriate for a school subject. Let me finish. Right, Uncle Stevens snapped. If it's too much for you, help yourself to a snack in the kitchen. Well, Olivia wants to know what happened. I heard, I heard her mother mumble something and walk away. Olivia and her uncle were alone. I imagined her looking at him expectantly. So did she find the radio? Or did it get ruined when the school got blown up? He rest, and I heard the distinct click of a lighter. That letter, he began slowly, had a date on it. What date? She inquired hungrily. It was, it was dated two weeks before we started rebuilding the school. Didn't you say the school had been destroyed like two years ago? Yes, replied Great Uncle Stephen. It had been. There was silence as it, it, I felt goosebumps on my arms. The images that came to my mind were, were almost too overwhelming to express. But great uncle Stephen put them, put them into words effortlessly. Clearly he had spent his whole life thinking about it. This man, this Stanislav, went to a vandalized falling apart schoolhouse he cleaned up blood and rumble like it was spilled drinks and dust. He smiled at dead bodies in the hallway and believed they were smiling back at him because they, they liked his radio. He moved around courses so he could sweep the ground under, under them. The roof was half collapsed, so when it rained, he must have gotten soaking wet. But it was, but it was so obvious that he didn't even feel a thing. I could hear Olivia crying steadily. I found the lighter he was talking about. It was all pickled, preserved food, and probably tasted like shit. Most of the stuff was moldy. Did, did you see the dead body? Yes, hanging from the ceiling, but still amazingly lifelike. He wasn't riding away. This hadn't happened years ago. Did he look peaceful? She asked, a chord of desperation in her voice. I couldn't tell you. The smell was rank, and his face was blue, and his eyes was bulging like this. I imagine him demonstrating. In the radio? Olivia wept. I heard a great Uncle Stephen take a long drag of his cigarette. It was there, alright. And it was still on.